Hey everyone and welcome to the Broken by Concept podcast. We've got Nathan Mott, we've got Coach Curtis. Now, before we dive in to this mailbag episode, but we're going to call it the mailbag bonanza. Mailbag special. bonanza, exclusive um, mailbag episode. I want to get the listeners into a league mindset, get their brains ticking, right? Think um, about someone as rift. Think about something. <laughs> Just think about something. And then, so essentially, I've had this thought, right? I'm going to pose this as a bit of a thought experiment, a question to the, to the listeners. You know, when you think of, you hear these conversations, you know, you see these tier lists all over social media. What's, what's harder? You know, what's the harder champion? What's the, what's the easy champion? What's the hard champion? This champion's easier than that champion. This champ's Elo Inflator. This champ's that, right? And you hear the most ridiculous takes. And you always hear one tricks, obviously being defensive when their champion is being mentioned, Right. And, you know, you could easily write that off as, you know, they've obviously put a lot of time and effort into that champion and they, they want to defend their defend their stance, obviously. And make, that makes sense. In my experience, you know, having to, to coach all of these different champions, and I've had the luxury of playing a wide variety of champions. I've just realized how, how little the average person knows in terms of what makes a champion difficult. Now, I want to use the example of Yone for a second, okay? Yone... It's so hilarious because from the outside you hear from what jugglers, do people say? What do they? Well, say? from you hear it all the time. Yeah. You, you and Charlie always talking. Yona's yeah. the most broken Best champion. champion yeah. yeah, people otherwise Yona. Eddie carries in top lane is complaining about Yona. Yeah, jungles all from the time. From a jungler's perspective, for ganking because he can buy so much time with his E and also the, the you know what I mean. The Q3 it's and a R, lot of a lot of right. kerfuffles happen. And even people who haven't played <laughs> Yona before, mid laners think, oh yeah, Yona. They don't view Yona as an overly complicated champion or very hard champion. Um, nonetheless, right? You know, I, I kind of felt the same until I played it. And then you play a champion like Yone, you get through the lane phase, and even the lane phase, you know, it's, it's kind of okay. What makes Yone difficult is his mid game. His mid game is one of the hardest in mid lane, in my opinion. Mm. Harder that you would think of, you think of champions like Akali, and you think of champions like Kiana and, and all that, and you think that they might even be harder because maybe they're harder mechanically to execute or whatever it might be or maybe their combos are more sophisticated. It doesn't actually matter because with Yone, oh, sorry, with Akali and Kiana, your reference points are way, way clearer. You have a much clearer idea of what your job is in a fight and how specifically, like what target you need to get on and how to get on that target. It's a lot clearer. Like you take Kiana, for example, you have very, you know exactly where your damage is coming from. Your ability, your, your damage is tied completely, basically tied to your raw cooldowns, like your R cooldown, you know, your your W and things like that. Same as the color, you need your R, um, your, your Q, your, your W, it's like a huge thing. Everything revolves around your stealth and everything. Like you have these clear abilities, like these clear reference points. Now we're not talking now, I'm not talking micro execution. I'm talking just reference points. Um, and so when people automatically think about the complexity of the champion, they automatically jump to micro and execution. They don't even, they don't think about reference points. They don't think about the difficulty of like, how do I, how do I know what to do in this particular instance? How do I even get my damage off? And so, um, you know, when we think of a champion, how easy or how hard they are, you know what we do, our brain works. What I think it, it well, what I think it, how it works. We think of the last time we versed it when we got beaten by it, and we think of that best case scenario where the stars align and where their strengths, what their strengths are. Yeah, very good. Yeah. When people think about Rek'Sai, they think, oh yeah, Rek'Sai is so easy. He's so OP. Blah blah blah. He's so good in solo queue. Okay, they they're thinking of that El Clasico Rek'Sai three camp gank. You know, the stars align, the lanes pushed up. No, ga- no You're counter able ganks. to like repeat gank it. And- so simple, right? Yeah. They don't look at the game. They're not in those games where the lane's not ganking. I can't three camp gank. I actually have to full clear on Rek'Sai and then... Or no. the Rek'Sai just, f- just spam ganking and just get nothing to waste Or that, yeah, you missed that first game. three levels. They yeah. don't think of them what it would be like to play Rek'Sai from that situation. Yeah. They're only viewing Rek'Sai from that one particular <clears throat> instance or maybe the handful of instances that the, the stars completely align. They're thinking in the best case scenario. They're not thinking of all the tricky situations. They're I have look- another example with uh, Kha'Zix. I was doing a live coaching with... Uh, this guy called Kami Kazix, he's like a famous Kazix okay. player, I think. Um, on he's like a streamer. Um, he's like 400 LP master, and we were in the mid game, 
and I was like relatively lost. I was like, this is really hard to sort of execute mm. the mid game. Because like, assassins are hard to execute in yeah. mid game. Like a lot of people will think about cards, you know, super broken jam. I was like, just get one shot, damage is broken. But we were trying to navigate the situation. We we're playing a comp that was like full melee. Like it was a really, it was really struggling. Yeah. Like I was really struggling if we had actually win this game in the mid game. Like as you're saying there, like the yeah. Viona like thing. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and again, it's like, yeah, sure, we have damage. And, and we do a lot of damage, but you also got to remember, how do I get that damage off? Where do mm. I... Because if they see me, they're going to back off. I'm, I have like v limited gap closing Squish potential. Squish up, no you've real good utility. I've no, yeah, mm. not amazing utility. It's hard for me to get my damage off. So people don't think of it in terms like that. They think of when they think of Yone, or... You know, a hole breaker, Kraken, split pushing in the side lane, stars align, everything beautiful, you know? They don't think of, oh shit... Uh, I can't maybe win the side that hard. My team's getting engaged upon. I have to team fight. How do I stack my Q3? I've got no CC to set up my R. What do I do? And they just shit the bet. But it's only people who have played Yone really understand that. Only, and so, and I think that the, 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 the thought, or I guess the question I want to pose to people is, whenever you ask, whenever you have this, if you ever have that thought of, this champion is so easy, or, um, you know, you're, um, you, you tend to think of a particular champion as OP, you know, I would take time to really play it. I even at a baseline level, play it in a normal game or even just watch watch VODs from that their perspective and really be honest with yourself. Would you do this? Like go into the mid game, watch a Yone mid game or if you're, if you, if you're confused about a Rek'Sai, just watch a Rek'Sai mid game. Just like watch the game from their perspective and really and, and try to be introspective. Where is your bias coming from? Is there bias? And I, I just think that like, a lot of us are really, really misguided when it comes to champ difficulty and um, and overall, the overall strength of other champions you don't play. So I think it's important that we're humble about this sort of stuff and really hold... I think it's better to to, to kind of just be open-minded that, okay, I might I don't really know the difficulty of the champ. I, I really actually can't gauge the strength of the champ because I haven't really played it. Yeah. You know? Instead of just being on the social media tier, spewing verbal garbage in a way. Just... Because the thing is, is when you say a statement like that, you leave yourself very volatile. Because if you have this belief that a champion is OP or really easy to play, and then you get beaten by that champion, or or uh, you know you try to play it and you can't play it, you're you're setting yourself up to fail. You're you're creating these potential. It's like the seeds of narratives that could grow into something worse in the future. You know what I mean? Mm, yep. It's like it's better to just be open minded about everything. I don't know. I don't. It's okay to say I don't know. <laughs> I just simply don't know. You know. Don't know, and I'm curious about the weaknesses of the champ. Let me explore the weaknesses. Yes. Everything's got a crack in the armor. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a lesson I've learned. That's a lesson I've learned, and I just wanted to kind of pass that on. Love so, it. people thinking, get the creative juices flowing. Let's jump into mailbag, mailbag. now. So, we do these every once in so often, Curves, because my mailbag gets overflown. There's so many people coming in. So, we try and it's sort of not sustainable to just do three per episode. Some episodes we don't even do it because we have a guest or something yep. like that. So, the mailbag's overflowing. It's overflowing, out of control. Yep. So, this episode's all about the community, Curtis. We got to hear about the community. What are some of their problems? Maybe let's look at some success stories as well. Share some of their lessons that they've learned from watching the podcast over a while. We think that's valuable. Let's jump straight in, Curtis. Yep. Let's do it. First one here comes from. Uh, someone by the name of Coles. The title of this email is Old OG Gamer Dad, who now sucks. Hey guys, I've been playing League since beta, and I used to be really good when everyone else sucked at the game. I'm active enough a listener to know how cringe it is to bring up the past ranks, so I'm bringing it up simply for context. I used to literally play with the OG pros for duos and ranked fives, like Reginald, Dyrus and even stream for TSM's original Justin.tv stream. For context, by the way, guys, like that would have been 2011, 2012. That's like 12 years ago. Long time. So this is, this is OG. It's an OG. And playing since beta, the beta would have been in what? 2008 and nine, I think. I'm not sure. Something like that. So this guy's been, yeah. Something like that. A long time. Anyway. He says, I tape it off after. Took school seriously, graduated, got a good paying job, and just had a kid. I'm 31 years old now. Insane how old this game we love is, huh? I maintained Diamond for 10 or so years, and these past three years, I have become capped. People have really improved quite a lot. I am slowly grinding my way painfully to Emerald. Here is my problem. My VOD reviews feel quite unproductive. I consistently walk out of every loss, analyzing every death and decision, and coming to the conclusion that it was a relatively high percentage play. 
weigh in things like shutdowns and um, EV. Expected value. Expected value, yeah. So it's sort of like uh, high percentage players. Yeah, it's like what would I get from this? this? If I I were to go for this play, what's the expected value? If I get the kill or I don't get the kill or, you know. I also tend to play a more Aguran style, but I'm starting to feel I should just play something selfish and ganky like Echo instead of Jarvan Graves. I feel like I'm playing out of my mind and me nor my friends have been able to find a very few mistakes we VOD review together. This has been true of the past two years and it's so frustrating that I cannot figure out what to fix that I eventually quit for a year. When I watch others, the mistakes are glaring. I wish mine were glaring. I'm quite often flame horizon, highest KP, MVP, ace, and average about four or high KDA on my mains. My win rate does not reflect it. I mute all every game as well and have relatively high quality pings and chat. Here is my profile. So he's currently sitting at Platinum 2. So as I said, he's struggling to get uh, Diamond. He's been, yeah, high Plat, Diamond most seasons. Again, he says Diamond. He hasn't really finished a lot of seasons Diamond. So maybe he peaked it. Yeah, peaked it for these seasons, then took some breaks. Okay. All right. And yeah, he's not played much this season at all. What jumps out to you here? Uh, little played games played this season. Mm. Um, let's see how much he's playing per season here, Curtis. Maybe that's an interesting yeah, statistic. Yeah, no, I here. agree. So Curtis split even split one. What are you playing split one? So basically nothing in split one. Okay, that's very interesting. Nothing in yet yeah, that season. That's maybe when he t- took the break. Maybe. Yeah. So this is his year break. And nothing. Not, two, not th- this is two thousand twenty one, dude. Two thousand twenty. So he hasn't played. Okay. That's a decent amount of games. No, I mean, not a, not a shit ton, but... Yeah, but when we're talking about for 2020... He but what, what played... rank did he finish in 2020, though? Let's take a look at this one. Whoops. Where were we? Dude, your uh, screen Platinum is... Two. Platinum 2. Your screen is so dark, dude. This is dark mode, Curtis. People like dark mode. So he didn't really play in Season 9 either. Yeah. Please tell me he played in Season 8. Didn't play in Season 8. Okay, played in Season 7. So we go back here. Season 7, so he... Didn't play that, so he was platinum five. So, yeah. I mean, we don't play the game. Just don't play it. Like, <laughs> right? Like, so let me reread this. Let's reread this. This is great. Thank God we got the context. Of I love this. I love it when people actually show either the gameplay or the OPG. Yeah. At minimum. It tells a pretty big picture there. So, yeah, I mean, I think it. I think the first line is sort of what he's come, coming to. Like, I used to be a... Uh, it's a great player. You know, one of the top players on the server. You know, and it's like sort of an analogy. Like I used to go to the gym, mm. you know, like four or five days a week. And now I go three, four times Well, think about month. it. Nathan. There was literally like four or five years there yeah. where there was barely any games, right? So I don't know if this is your main account or you're playing in other accounts. But from what you've shown us here, I don't know why you would just send this account. Yeah, this exactly. must be your so account. It must be his own account, yeah. right? Yeah. I think you're absolutely spot on. It's, it's basically saying... It's like saying I go to the gym I go, once I, a month. No, I went to the gym for, for, for six years. I then took four years off and um, I'm confused as why I'm not even remotely the same rank or similar, remotely similar. Doesn't, I mean, you know, it doesn't really, of course you're going to, you're going to get weaker in that period, right? Much weaker. So I think there's, there's definitely an element of lack of games played. Yep. You know, you know, what's really interesting, Nathan, I think what this really comes down to is that what would be happening is they'd be coming in, right? And they think that it's like, okay, if I just play a handful of games, if I play, you know, 50 games, surely that's enough. You know, surely that's enough to get me back to, you know, I should be surely climbing. And I think that really ties into like the, uh, again, I think the expectations, Nathan. I think it's expectations. He was once this great player. He, um, you know, can't let go. Yeah. Right. He expects that if he whips in 50 games or... You'll be like, oh, back to diamond. You know, I should really be back easily. to diamond really easily. And and the reality, I think he he like he said it in the email, the player base has gotten significantly better. You gotta get the reps in, dude. You gotta get the reps in. I'm actually still looking. He plays a lot of league, dude, but A Rams, normals, flex, and and, and actually just recently he's been grinding rank. So by the way, he sent this email in eight hours ago. Mm. So this actually looks to me, sort of to call you out here. You started playing ranked a lot <laughs> in the last got a reality week. check. Got a reality check after how many games, you know, after, you know, 
50 games and you're just struggling to get towards... And to be honest, I actually think he's doing good. He's, cl- yeah, he's climbing. He's plat too. Like he's climbing. We're actually climbing. A little bit. Now, you know, like a little bit. Yeah. But you're sort of getting to your level. It's actually... I think it makes perfect sense. You've gotten to the level that you've... It's taking about 60 games to get to the level that you were ex- basically... Roughly. Roughly in the last couple of years. So barely playing the game. I think his problem is that he feels like he doesn't even know what's going wrong. But I think that you're so early on in your journey, you know, with the amount of games played, you shouldn't really even think too much. You just get the reps in. Yeah, just get the reps I think, in. Okay, so this is something I really want to highlight here, okay? All right. When League was played back in Season 1, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, not including beta, Season 1, Season 2, Season 3, Season 4, you know, the first five seasons, really. Let's just say, let's push them all into a category. I would say the execution aspect of the game wasn't really that, it wasn't that brutal. Like, no one was really that mechanically insane. The things that we thought were mechanically insane back then with Insect, I literally, I saw gold, like nowadays, silvers, high silvers and low golds doing what we would deem as the peak League of Legends. Think about that. Just put that in perspective. Just mm. literally think about that. The context of the, time. The peak of League of Legends, everyone, the whole crowd, everyone was like, oh my God, Insec. You know, when Lee Sin did the, the, the you know, for those of you who don't even know that reference, is when like Lee Sin uses the ward hop, ward hop kick, kick back, yeah. flash kick back yeah. into the team or whatever. That's something you see in literally silver. Mm. No joke. I see that in my blow gold, my blow platinum program, right? But in gold. And... That was the peak of League of Legends. It's also I think about like Faker had him in season three. He was famous and he became the best player in the world because he was mechanically gap in like ev- like the world's. But best even the players. mechanics weren't amazing. They weren't. Right? Am- you look back, yeah, like, like really, they're like, the standard now, right? But the standard you don't, now. You, there's no such thing as that big mechanical gaps nowadays. No, no. My, my point being is that the game has become more and more execution based. Yeah, that's okay, my point. My it. point being yeah. is that back then because no one really knew what they were doing and the game was so unsophisticated you didn't need to have like you didn't need to be sh- sharp and tight and fast and quick and efficient nothing everything was slow mm-hmm. like a, a really great me- a analogy or i guess a metaphor for like league is like you know how fast paced life is nowadays like you get food delivery instant you can order shit online and come to amazon prime the next day you go down we live in nathan you know live in an apartment boom downstairs to the shops you can get your food in out come back in your apartment five minutes toss boom go 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 everything is so fast paced think about how long in the like say in the 60s everything would, would have taken just to send a letter just to get a message to someone just to even organize a dinner or a coffee with with a, with like someone who is you know a, a kilometer away was so difficult. You had to like use your bicycle down down the road and knock on their door and see if they're home. And if they're they not home, f- shit. You I know think what they mean? had phones there as well, Kurt. I think. <laughs> Do they have phones? They were in the sixties. No, I don't think. I think sixties oh, or fifties. Yeah, like is a landline. It? Right, but not everyone had. Yeah, well, yeah, a landline, but not everyone had a landline That's in true. their own home. Like yeah, my dad it. didn't have a landline oh, okay. in his home. Like yep. they would have to go out into the road, find a landline, yep. hoping that they would be at a landline. Like, you know what I mean? Like the logistics of just even the basics of life mm. were so difficult. Mm. In, and so as a result, life was so slow paced. You would just rock up somewhere, wait half an hour, do that. Everything was slow. Just to get shit done in a day was hard, right? Same in League. Everything was so slow in season one, two, and three, four, five. Like the game phase. Dude, games, I can't really remember that well, much. Games went for like yeah. 50 minutes. Yeah, there was a slugfest. The yeah. ma- I remember um, Monte Cristo watching Worlds in season three was like the term rotations. Like the idea that you would shove a wave and rotate to another place on the <laughs> yeah. map was like, oh Instead my God. Instead of A-ramming, God. yeah. You know, oh my God, you can actually move around the map. I'm not glued to my lane. <laughs> yeah. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, that's how unsophisticated the game was. Yeah. So I think that what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that like, think of think of like League in those seasons as like the 60s or the 50s. And then think of now as like, you know, we're in 2020, 2023, whatever it is. Shit's fast, fast paced. You've got to be efficient. You've got to be quick. You've got to know what you're doing. Wings Execute, on, right? into the details, Execution. Yeah, everything into the is faster and quicker and more efficient. It's more brutal. So like, that's it. So in order to adapt to that environment, there's going to be, a, it's going to take time to acclimate. You got to, you got to get involved. You got to get games in and you got to build those, build that muscle memory. Yeah. Like, honestly, I think that Cole shouldn't panic. I think if he gets the games in, he'll, you know, if, if you have played at high elos before, like you're probably going to have a good, it sounds like, you know, a pretty competitive game. I think you just need maybe have the, maybe he doesn't have the time that much anymore. Like I feel like if he put in the time, he'll be able to comfortably improve at the game. He, away, yeah. he, he talked about, you know, having problems with reviews. Like, I don't think it's a review problem at all, dude. I think it's a reps problem. 
And just getting a feel for the game and the game pace. I think so too. <clears throat> I mean, look, like, yeah, reviews, well, you can get there. Like, but just get the reps in first. Get mm. the reps in first, play the game, get like 100 games under your belt. And then we can start to, you can start to chip away. Like, hmm, you know, why did my top lane die here? Or what did I do here? Or, you know, just start to observe the basics. And if you're really that confused, Nathan has his salty program, which yeah, that right. will solve all of your problems all your in problems. an instant. So. That's right. So if you don't, if you're really that stressed about it, you can literally get a review next week from Nathan, and solve all of your problems. Honestly, I would, I would, I just wouldn't even reckon he joins Salto until he at least gets, gets games in, gets That's at no least a hundred games in. I don't, I don't care about your win rate at all, dude. I wouldn't really care about your win rate. Yep. All right, next one here. Let's do a success story, Curtis. See right. what we can learn from someone else. This is from. Uh, Central in the Midland Academy. The title of this email is Achieving Challenger. Hello, Nathan and Curtis. About one month ago, I achieved Challenger. I hope not to make this too long, but I want to share a bit about my journey in hopes to inspire and give insights to others. Fantastic. This is what this podcast is all about, Mr. Central. I joined the Midland Academy, which is Curtis's coaching program, in June of 2022. At the time, I was con consistently bouncing between D1 and Master Zero LP. Within a few months after joining the Milan Academy, I skyrocketed to Grandmaster because of the intensity buff and learning about champion identity. This was the first time I even had a name for the idea of intensity, and it's incredible how much just having high intensity could do for you. I find this really common with the long-time players that have played in D1 Master for a long time. They're relatively good. They just really play auto part, low intensity. They can get to GM quite quick. I don't even think it's that much to do as well with like my mm. program and stuff. It's like just getting someone to be, hold you accountable with your games. Like, what are you doing here? Come on, let's focus up. Where's get my team? Curious. Where's your team? Just being curious, being open-minded. Being curious, yeah. I wouldn't even say they need these crazy concepts no. and we're going to teach them crazy things. Like I have the same experience there with um, the, these type of players. I learned a lot over the next few months, but my individual league progress stagnated because I was playing for my university team. I dropped to about 250 LP and stayed there for the rest of the season and even the entire next split. But even after I was no longer playing for the team, I wasn't making any progress in my journey. And through the help of a friend, I realized that there were things in my life that I wasn't addressing that I needed to if I wanted to achieve my goal of challenger. I hit the lowest point I had ever been in my life. I can already hear Nathan saying, love it. I went from thinking I had everything figured out to feeling like I knew nothing. My confidence and relationships were struggling massively and I had to completely start from scratch and figure out what the hell was actually going on. This is where David Goggins quote, the most important conversations you'll ever have are the ones you'll have with yourself. That Curtis always brings up comes into play. Over the next few months, I feel I had to dig and pry at myself to realize what I need to, to get my life truly in shape rather than just uphold some facade. I realized that I had been letting problems build up and pretending like they didn't exist because I didn't want other people to see that I had problems. I had to have some really tough conversations with myself and figure out what things I needed to address that had been eating at me. I had to make hard decisions and put myself in unfamiliar and scary situations I'd never been in so that I could actually make progress. I could feel myself wanting to just forget about it all and go back to the ignorance that I was in for so long, but I didn't let that fear control me. So over that time, I really sat down and addressed the issues going on in my life that were holding me back. Also, my confidence was so linked to external factors and my performance that when I made mistakes, I would lose all confidence in myself. The Anne Hathaway interview you guys showed talking about failing loudly, as well as Kobe Bryant clips where he talks about the confidence to fail made me realize how wrong I was about confidence because I thought confidence was knowing that you couldn't fail, but really it's knowing that you will fail, but you will also learn from that mistake. After that time, I spent away from the game figuring all of this out, which truly felt like going through hell. I finally was ready to get back into it and there was no more fucking around. I played my favorite champ. I played with high intensity. I committed hard to every decision knowing that was how I was going to learn. Just cleaning up all those issues I hadn't addressed previously got me back to Grandmaster. And the final breakthrough for me 
was both a review I had with Curtis and a video he released on changing threat and mental stack allocation based on the champions in the game. It's crazy from that point on, I realized that I was trying to apply a generic solution to a specific problem and obviously it wasn't working. I finally truly got into the details of each game and when I did that, I felt unstoppable. I have maintained over 1,000 LP challenger for this month and I've never felt more confident in my ability to take on challenges in any pursuit. And it sounds so fake until you get there, but it really isn't about the rank. It's about able to look back at that time when I felt so low and realize that I made it through that point and came out on top. That is the true reward. So my learnings, be intense, address problems early on, fail loudly and be confident in your ability to learn. Commit to your decisions and get into the details. But most importantly, I learned I, that I truly can take on any challenge that I'm faced with. Thanks for preaching such important messages every week. I know I couldn't have gotten here without them. You guys are truly changing lives. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Central, for writing that. I mean, I think that, I mean, that's so moving, honestly. I, I mean, here, you know, we've said this a few times, but these emails, it, it justifies everything. You that's know, right. the work, like these podcasts we do, this is... You know, that's worth any amount of time, money, anything, you know, that like we've, you know, he's changed, he has changed his life, yep. the trajectory of his life. Yep. Once again, demonstrating the value that League of Legends has, Ranked has. This is what we love about the game, exciting about it and how he's realized a lot of high elo players and challenger players wouldn't really be talking this way as well. Like the fact that he's able to identify that, it's like unlocked some part of his brain. Yeah. You know, that last line here saying, I learned that I can truly take on any challenge I'm faced with. Whether that might be might be delusional. Like that's his belief system now. Yeah, right? that's your he's, belief system. He's created this belief system, which is extremely powerful for me having a growth mindset, right? One thing here, he says, I finally truly got into the details of each game. This is going back to our fake process that yeah. we see a lot of our students sometimes have. Truly getting the details, approaching, tackling problems with intensity, with focus, with curious mindset is big difference in like, oh, chipping away, doing the three-block process, I'm reviewing my games. There's a big difference. And I feel, it feels like that sounds like what he was doing there was um, a half-assed process, review process. You know, and, and, and what I think this is as well, Nathan, is that, you know, taking league, like really taking league seriously, it's a decision. It's a big decision. It really is. Anyone can log on league, play a half ass game with League of Legends, get happy at a win, get pissed off at a loss, and then leave. Anyone can do that, hmm. right? That's Anyone. easier to do, yeah. Easier to do. Yeah. There, there is a decision that, you know, if you really want to get long-term amazing results in league, you have to... You really have to be vulnerable. You really have to... It's like it's like you're signing your... You're signing your, you know, your signature on the bottom of the solo queue contract, and... It's scary. It, 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 it fundamentally, people want the glory of getting these amazing high ranks and being this amazing player. Without, will, they don't want the pain. They can't. They, they they want to get the result without the process. They want to get that raising high rank. They want to get the prestige of being this amazing challenger player, this super sophisticated player, reaching amazing levels. You know, people watching and looking up to them, but they don't want to go through the the shit. Mm. Because you know what they see when he said about the confidence thing? You see people like Anne Hathaway, this amazing actor, mm. Kobe Bryant, and you you tie, oh, they're really confident people, right? Yeah. And you tie, oh, that's what confidence... That's just what they are. That's just what they are. But yeah. they're forgetting the, the all the failures that no one saw because there wasn't a big audience mm. or, you know, the all the missed shots. By, everyone just looks at the highlights of their career and their achievements, right? But you're not looking at the the decades of failing loudly, right? Yeah, It's 100%. missed. And that's sometimes what the, you know, the culture of, yeah, again, like the highlight reels of like Instagram and all that sort of stuff. People just looking at people at their best and it's just... We see the end. Yeah, we're seeing the end result. Yeah, you know... AJ, and that's what people think that confidence is for some reason. Yeah, I mean, how could you know otherwise though? You know, that's not... It's not like that's broadcast you on a silver platter. Right? It's not like, that, you know, hey, little Jimmy, this is actually how confidence is built. It's like, no, this, there's this thing, you know, they just... And then you, you, you automatically jump to the conclusion that... That's just who they are. They're different. They're built different. You know, that's the whole. They're just born confident. They're born confident. Right? <laughs> but you know, AJ, he's a, an Emma, a coach in my program and and high elo NA player, 
And something he does a really good job of. So he's a Yone. He was a like a long-term Yone player. Very, very good Yone player. And when, you know, so people pick up Yone. And they ask him all these questions. AJ, how would you play this team fight? How would you do this? How would you do this? And, and AJ says a lot of the time, this is a really hard fight. I wasn't able to... I wouldn't have been able to win this fight. It took me years. It literally took him years mm. to be able to navigate these fights. And so he knows, like when, when he's like watching, so he's like kind of the end game, right? He's like, okay, he's the insane Yone mastery, really, really great player. And he sees people kind of stepping onto the boat, right? He sees them take that first step. He knows, AJ knows, as soon as they take that first step, right? He's like, okay, there's a whole lot of shit in store for you. You don't even know what you're getting yourself yeah. into. But AJ knows this. Yeah. And so so when people ask these questions such as like, what should I build all the time? Like that's the most common question with Yone. Like, what should I build? What are you, but why are you building that? You know, he's always just trying to get them to think about, well, you know, the, the ability usage and, and the mindset. And, and, he, and he's just trying to get, let them know this is the skills that you're going to have to develop. And it's going to take years. It's going to take a long time. You're not going to go from you know, this level of play to, 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 to get even remotely close to how I'm executing team fights. And I think that like the, you know, it, it needs to come from the top. It needs to come from the people that have the mastery who've been through this journey from the centrals, you know, these people and say, look guys, this is just going to be a b really big journey. And, and, and we're just going to be able to have to take one thing away at a time. There's a lot of time back to the last email. It's just like a lot of, a lot of muscle memory needs to be built. Um, and it's a journey and it's a journey to get here. And it's a, and it's a very, very hard one at that. And, you know, and I think that not everyone's willing to take that journey. Not everyone's, not everyone even knows what they're signing up for in a way. Um, and so, yeah, you, you know, and I think that a lot of people just skim around the edges. They don't want to, they'd rather not even take that journey. They try to find a shortcut. They try to find a shortcut. Hard, but rewarding journey. I think back to the quote, Curtis, of was it last episode? Mm. You gotta like the taste of your own. You get punched in the mouth, punched, in, punched so many times. You like the taste of your own blood. Yeah, that's right. You gotta learn to en enjoy the taste of your own blood. Yeah, that's right. So thank you so much, Central, for sharing. This is absolutely amazing, and I think that it's a testament to also the importance of getting your real life situation sorted, hmm. the, in the significance of stage four problems and how they can impact your journey. If you do, if you have stage four problems in the back of your mind, you've got unaddressed issues. You must fix them first, otherwise you are never going to be able to reach your your potential. You're never going to express your best self, and your league journey is going to be very, very, very painful. All right, uh, next one here. This one comes from uh, Matt. Tyler's email is thoughts on coaching and accountability. Dear Curtis and Nathan, I've recently discovered the Broken by Concept podcast and have really enjoyed the more cerebral approach to learning League of Legends. I'm new to the game, but find your takes on coaching to be really interesting. I myself work as a skills development coach, assisting athletes in refining or developing individual skills. This usually includes things like teaching mechanics, timings, and thought process, options, and oftentimes using these skills to manipulate opponents to allow your strength to show. I personally want to see my players in a baseline state, a panic state and a flow state because that allows me to identify patterns of weaknesses in play pattern and mentality as well as the strengths in those areas. So with that, I'm really curious to know more about your thought process on choosing the type of VODs um, to review for your students. Having your thoughts will be quite helpful to me not only as a coach but also a player just starting their League of Legends ranked journey. So I've got an interesting take on this. Okay. Um, you know, at the start of my coaching journey, I was very particular. I want to see this, you know, these sorts of VODs, um, you know, so on and so forth. The more I've coached, the less I care. And the reason being is that the VOD they pick is extremely telling either way. All right. So you, so the the way you got to view the the way you view it is that the vod they select gives you its insight in of itself, not the learnings from the vod, but the type of vod they because choose. Because they're basically saying this is what I think my problem in my game is. Help me figure out, solve it for me, Mister Coach. That's right. And if, this is what I think the problem this is. What is. They, yeah, exactly. And you're you're really getting insight <laughs> into what they think it yes. is, right? 
So the thing is, right, if they if I, if if they bring in a VOD where it's them doing really well, they bring in this game where they're going 8 and 0 and then they have like two losing sides and they lose. That's very telling as to like what sort of person you're dealing with and the way they're viewing their league journey. Um and they're typically people that they don't understand how, you know, um it, they're trying to win the games that they're, they're trying to they're, they're directing all of this attention on the games that they're that they're getting ahead they're not directing they're like leaving to the side all the games that they did really poorly Just ruining the game and stuff like that right yeah. they're looking for the they're looking for that kind of little secret little tidbit that little tip that's going to push them over the edge when in reality there's a bulk of other other mistakes that they're looking over um vice versa if someone does pick a really good quality vod you, it tell it tells you okay this guy actually knows his shit this guy understands what this is about and you can kind of already kind of get into it you just know so that's my advice my advice is actually let the client pick the vod and then that will give you a huge indication of where they're at in their journey and then that you know sometimes by the way in my reviews i've had this before where the vod is so bad i'll just i'll just be like okay there's not much we can take away from this and then we go we 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 kind of have a discussion about stage four things so why did you pick this VOD? And then we have we had the discussion about like the why you picked this VOD. You yeah, know, that's, that's a helpful discussion into the have, mental yeah. side of things. You know, yeah. and then typically that's a sign that they have some sort of stage four issues relating to their relationship with the game and or poor relationship. Well, I don't understand how improvement works in league, um, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of my two cents there about that one. You know, some people in Salto have they don't trust themselves at all for choosing a VOD. So what they actually do is they do a three block and they tell me to randomly pick a, hmm. a game from it. Cause they're like, I just, I, I just don't want to have that thought process. Just, just pick one. And cause we just, let's just see the reality. Let's just see real. Right. Yeah. I like I that approach. That. I, I think love it's a really that. good approach because they can't trust their biases and stuff like that. You know, again, that's like right. choosing a VOD. But again, like that's what to say. I think that, that that bias of them choosing a specific VOD, again, you can get into that actually tells you something. Exactly. I think there's still something. so much learnings in that way as well. It tells you what they think is important in league. Yes. You know, so the biggest, if I were to really simplify it, it tells you, does this person emphasize the micro mechanical aspect of the game or do they do they think about are they big picture thinkers do they think about like win conditions do they think about the macro or they or are they so obsessed about mid-game macro that they've completely overlooked the laning phase either way it gives you a really great indication of what type of player they are what their strengths are what their weaknesses are yeah yeah, and I'm similar. I, I really don't care. I've never really cared about the mm. VOD. Just show me a VOD that's problem solved. As long as it's on your main champion, I don't get, really yeah, care. Yeah, that's right. Like Any VOD's a good VOD. A lot of the way that my program works and the way I like to review is just, it's sort of like just seeing situations again. The longer you're in your program, the longer you're watching reviews thing, you'll see the way I'm reviewing what I'm prioritizing. Just come and just get it. Because, you know, people get this trying to find the perfect VOD and yeah. just get rid of that mentality. Bring something. I don't care if it's a yeah. win. I don't care if it's a 10-0 perfect game. Make, make sure that your order decision making makes sense high percentage hopefully you can explain to me why things are you know going i think lower. where i want to be very careful though because he's probably he's working i'm assuming with athletes or with people that are very high, already high level individuals mm. the thing that you know nathan and i find is that um in our programs people don't even know they, they haven't even begun their journey really like they're coming to us looking for a start point they're saying curtis i i've never or nathan i've never reviewed pr 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 probably before i don't really have, i've never had a process i've never taken my league journey that seriously I need, I need guidance, right? And so um, a lot of the time, we just want them to feel comfortable just looking at a situation and taking one thing away from it. That's it right. may not it's be the biggest thing. It, is, yes. it may not be the biggest thing and that's okay. And like people get so caught up in the whole idea that I need to... I need to review the the most significant biggest yeah. thing in Otherwise my game. Otherwise, it's not. Yeah, Otherwise, exactly. it's a complete waste of time. Yeah. And you need to get out of that frame of mind. Yeah. Like you need to get comfortable, especially in league as a game, because you're you know you don't have a choice. Like you're in many many scenarios. You just have to be willing, in a way, kind of not reactive, but you just got to adapt to what's in front of you. And if if your takeaway from a given game is, oh, I um I didn't know Jarvan could do that much damage or i didn't know Carthus had enough uh mana for r if that's like the takeaway from a game so be it that may not be the biggest thing that's okay it's we're building the we're building the habit and we're getting comfortable with getting into the review and taking one or two things away and moving on so i think there's value in that you know that's how we feel we want people to get just get yeah, comfortable it's getting not into so the much details. the knowledge the information itself it's getting comfortable and, and Getting across the mindset of yeah. attacking problems. Attacking with problems. That I is agree. the biggest thing that yeah. that I want to get across in my programs. Once you've got that, then now let's start figuring out, you know, what, okay, what should we do in this That's right, because because once you get across that student mentality, what actually happens is that the quality of the VODs they bring will automatically increase naturally. 
because they will know, oh shit, if I've got that shooting mentality, of course I'm not going to bring this VOD. The next VOD they bring is going to be a much better quality VOD, you know? Um, so that, that that's that's really important. I want to kind of do a tangent here, Nathan. I, I, I did a daily tidbit. So I, I copied you and your program doing the daily tidbits instead of the weekly daily, tidbits, yep. right? And... Um, Okay, so you remember we did that chess episode a while ago with that, that lady who she went from zero to 2,500 ELO. 2,000 ELO, yeah. Right, yeah, her journey. We kind of did a, a video on that journey. Two years, two, zero to 2,000 ELO, yeah, in chess. And the, and she was talking about on that journey, um, and again, I'm going to make it very clear, I'm not a chess expert. The, the only pieces of chess content I've ever ingested is that chess video <laughs> yeah. and like Queen's Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most casual chess. I'm the most casual fucking chess player yeah. that possibly is, yeah. right? Um, so take this with a, with a grain of salt. Um, you know, there was a section of a journey where on that website, there was kind of like these puzzles. It was like chess.com. And so what you would do is that you would press the button and it would come up with like a board. And it's like, come up with the way to win the game from here, essentially, or something like that. Like, here's a, here's a what's the best scenario, move yeah. in this scenario? The way, you know, so in chess, in the realm of chess, they're very comfortable with taking a scenario, looking at a board and trying to figure out a solution. In League, for some reason, we're not comfortable. We're not okay with the idea that this may just be one puzzle. We're not comfortable with the idea that we, we, we may never see this situation again. But you've got to get comfortable with that idea. View every scenario in League as like a puzzle, one puzzle. And your job in the review is to go to those key pivotal puzzles and solve the puzzle. What could I have done better in this particular moment should i have gone top should i have targeted this guy should i have reset and then boom yeah you may never ever ever be in that scenario again mm. but the over time when you expose yourself to many 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 puzzles the oh shit things start to connect you start to see patterns things the start patterns, to make can, sense you can pull out principles from i yes. always try and create it and apply a principle here but you, know? you can never you can't pull principles out of your ass no principles are a result of putting yourself in many 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 scenarios so you need to learn to get comfortable with viewing league as just a thousand puzzles and you've got to complete a thousand puzzles it even ties into um the book uh, Ray Dalio's book Principles, where the way his life, the way he viewed his he viewed his life as a game, Ray Dalio, where I make a I make a business decision or a decision in my life, and I I I, I yeah I I get some output, and then I reflect on that that whole situation. Like we, we 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 this is kind of tying it into also the feedback loops. He observes it, and then he gets a piece of learning, and he views that oh I got a gem, and then when he connects a lot of gems. He can proceed to the next level in life. And that's how he's viewed his life. And that's how he's such a high level, you know, successful individual. Because he's just super open-minded, super curious, solving problems, getting these gems, and then moving to the next level. That's exactly what League is, except we have an element of execution. That's it. So I think that's just a healthy way to view the game. And that's what we try to get people. That's really the goal of our reviews. That's right. It's not so much. It's that, it is that one gem. But it's the I. It's the game. It's the game of collecting the gems themselves. That's the end. That's the, really the goal. Uh, he mentions here as well. Uh, also, if I may recommend a book that revolutionized my approach to individual coaching, The Inner Game of Tennis by Timothy Galway. Galway is an amazing approach to individual improvement and mentality. It completely changed my relationship with myself, my competitive performance, and exponentially improved my ability to change my player's mentality. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, we've talked about it on the podcast before. I actually mm. haven't read it properly. That's on my to-do list. You read it though, Curtis. Mm. Yeah, I think I read it twice. It's very good. All right. Very relevant to League. Moving on here. This one here is from GB. The title of this email is The Rabid Problem of Dehumanization! Exclamation mark. G'day, Nathan Modicus and Coach Curticus. I have developed a purely unique tool, which I have not seen before inside the league community that I wanted to share with you as well as ask a few questions too. We love hearing about people's toolkit. So let's mm, explore this tool. I this definitely tool. do. Yeah. For context of who I am, I, Gorilla Blonde, am a five season gold player who has had all stage stages of issues imaginable. I've had the teammates are stopping me from climbing and the my role is just weak and the my champion is just bad narratives and a plethora more 
I'm 20 years old and have been playing for seven seasons. When I first started playing, it was due to a childhood friend introducing me to the game. And as two young chaps, we immediately gravitated towards Tyler One being our role model. It was a fine time. Of course, playing the game for so long without a growth-based mindset and process built a laundry list of narratives and issues to work through. I have recently committed to ADC as it's my most played and understood role, as well as seeing ADC players on the big stages pulling off unimaginably difficult clutches gets my blood pumping and ready to ADC diff my games. It truly is what I believe to be the role for the superstars. Of course, I'm slightly exaggerating. My true true journey of the process has recently started with Varus, the most flexible and adaptable AD carry. Also the most satisfying when you yeet your Q at a school squishing dome and watch as their health bar drops like i just dropped a nuke on their cranium (laughs) (laughs) all this is a way of uh, me saying that i've committed and i want to keep going (laughs) so what is this magically in 200 iq tool that i have developed well modicus and codicus It's a simple tactic that I've used to solve a very specific issue, the dehumanization of the players around you. Now, as high ELO players, you probably can't relate to this as you know many of the players you verse. However, in lower ELOs, it would be a rare sight to see the same player twice. Now, why is this an issue? Well, I had an issue with tilt and toxicity. Why? Well, I believe it's because all I was seeing was a virtual character on a screen and not a human. This allowed me to express how I felt no matter the mood and not see it for what it is uh as they're just virtual beings right they aren't people right so what did i do all right all right i'll cut to the chase i implemented a protocol to my games which allowed me to humanize the players around me and over time slowly rewired my perception of the virtual characters i see running around the rift i started adding and messaging players who played particularly well regardless of a win or loss or friend or foe I would message them and say something along the lines of, hey, I just wanted to let you know that you played really well that game and I was envious of how well you executed your champion. I wish you the best in your solo queue journey and I hope to see you on the Rift again soon. I've almost always received a positive message back and even some players um, I've ended up talking to for half an hour just about life and other fun things. This simple straightforward protocol has allowed me to humanize the players I get the privilege to play alongside on the Rift and truly has started to rewire my perception of the virtual beings around me. Now to be clear, this is not for the people that I am messaging. This is not an act of kindness or an act to make someone's day uh, better. This is a selfish act to improve my perception of the players around me. This is for uh, me, not those you are messaging. What are your thoughts on this protocol? Obviously, it won't be feasible for everyone, but it works for me. Well, first things first, I just want to compliment his style of writing. I think it's he's he's definitely a uh, and he got interesting writing uh, style. Doesn't GB, let's uh, just write a book, dude. You should be writing a book. Um, Well, first things first. At the very beginning, he said AD carry is the role for superstars. I actually tend to agree. Mm. Right, Ruler, probably the best player in the world. Right Single-handedly, yep. you know, wins games. So I think you're on point there. I think number two, um, what a what a fast, like, what a day and age we live in, Nathan. Like, just think of it. Like, imagine, imagine, I'm just going to, this is ridiculous, Nathan. And this is going on a huge tangent. But imagine someone... From like, I mean, I'm, I'm going, I'm going back in time a lot in this episode. But yeah. Imagine someone, even from like the '70s mm. or the '80s, even like the '90s, like reading this email, like yeah, it'd be what, crazy, isn't it? What like does this what mean? the fuck? What like how? Yeah. Like where have we? Be- where, where are we? As yeah, a it would be crazy, isn't it? It's like they're talking some virtual game. Like we so, have to humanize people. We have to humanize people. Wow, yeah, that would be mind boggling, wouldn't it? If you put it in perspective, like what the hell, man? Yeah, like, where are we? It's like We're in a hundred some- years. What is what is the broken by concept podcast a hundred years from now? What are they talking about? Yeah. What problems are they solving? What are the pro- what, like look, think about this problem we're solving? We're talking yeah, about right now, yeah. like. What the fuck? Someone's like writing in like a hundred years, like, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing in this, like this dimension here. Yeah. And, like, you know, over here, like I'm struggling to like connect, like the, the parallel universes. Yeah. Here. I don't know. Or some shit like be that. Some like, th- something weird about his, like their relationship with the AI bot. Or yes. Like, they're humanizing something. Yes. Like 
<laughs> yes, dude. That's what. It, that's that's pretty close to. That's like ten thousand years away. I think. And it's just. In, it's just. I just want to like at a high level. This Respected. question is just so fascinating to me. Yeah. Like the fact that this person is twenty years old, mm. thinking like this. You know, like like they're thinking into perspective. Curse. It's I an like interesting like like. I was not thinking like this at twenty years old. You know, mm. like it's just a testament to how intellectual i guess or in a, in a way or a, a self-aware kind of this guy is for his age Goodness, maybe our our viewer base is just geniuses we're just gonna, we're just, we're just gonna yeah, you guys are the geniuses. best you guys are <laughs> geniuses if you're listening to this you're a genius um so there's that anyway i just want to get that off my chest um look i think that well first things first a toolkit is just that it, it, it's personal it, it's what works for you if it works for you it works for you and i think that if you felt that you've had a tendency to dehumanize people around you which to be honest there are probably a lot of people that have a, a similar problem, especially yeah, nowadays yeah. with how detached we can become from society and um, how, you know, lack of physical, like a, a human connection we have with people. And if you're spending a lot of time on league and playing a lot of league, I can definitely see that happening. Um, it's, it's, so it's interesting. It sounds like an incredibly wholesome thing, but at the same time, it's not mm. right. Like it, it is wholesome in the sense that he is having positive human interactions, but it's also not wholesome in the sense that it is done for like a selfish reason. But I don't really have a problem with that. Like, I think that we all do things like that. Like I, I, an example, I was watching an Anthony Bourdain uh, uh, episode of his show, you know, how he travels around countries and stuff. And he was interested, he was interviewing a, a restaurant owner and this, estra, this restaurant op uh, uh, owner, uh, he opened a restaurant in like this kind of small neighborhood. And then he was talking to him and he said, I didn't open this neighborhood. I, I didn't open this restaurant in this neighborhood for anyone else. I didn't do it for selfless reasons. I didn't do it to help the community. I didn't do it to, to deliver great food for other people to enjoy. It was purely selfish. It was actually a, an outlet for me to express who I am in a way. And I think that's the case for a lot of artists. I think a lot of people think, think that, or even, even philanthropists, I think that there are people that do good things to that, make, themselves feel, to good, make yeah. themselves feel good. Obviously mm. on the outside, you know, it can have positive impacts on the community. Like you think of even people like Steve Jobs and all these like really remarkable people. I think fundamentally they, they were doing it for selfish reasons. They had a, this thing inside them that they needed to get out and they couldn't function as people without it. So I don't really, you know, I would say this, this whole question is more of like a moral, it's more of a moral kind of question, a question of moral and ethics. And I would say that by, I think it makes total sense. And I think if it helps you be a, a better functioning human, it helps you be a better version of yourself. And you feel as though you're, you're, you're having more positive interactions and you're having a better relationship with the game, then by all means go for it. And if it works for you, it works for you. I wouldn't overthink it. Do it until it doesn't feel right. I think with anything like this, um, in your life, like, it, it, you know, whether you, you're going to go through phases, like, especially at that age, you're going to, you might do meditation for a bit and you're like, ah, oh, that's not for me. I'm going to do that. And oh, that's not for me. Like, I think trying things and just being introspective like this and, you know, um, trying to learn more about yourself is, is nothing but a, but, but a positive experience. So don't feel bad just because it's selfish. I, I don't think that's necessary. I think in a way you have to be selfish, mm. um, to some degree. So yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I think it makes sense <clears> to me. Yeah, nothing more to add. I think that's, uh, yeah, Curtis's perspective there. Again, I, I think that's very funny about this. Is these are the problems that we're having to solve in 2023? All right, moving on here. Um, this one here is from Trevor. The title of this email is "Off Metapics and Creativity." I was recommended your podcast a couple of months ago by a friend of mine and have become a huge fan. I started playing league in a five stack of friends at the end of the pandemic and for a very long time, two and two plus over two years, exclusively played with them. This resulted in severe playing alone anxiety. One thing you guys said in a recent episode was that ranked is like a dojo. I've been an avid martial artist for the last 15 years or so, and this line really clicked with me. Playing alone now feels more like I'm putting on my headgear and gloves to spar rather than gearing up for a cage fight. I've been regularly playing alone and in duo queue with my girlfriend and I'm starting to enjoy it. One thing I like to do is queue up in normals and try out wacky champs and builds. For example, I'm a support main and I've been playing Fiddle 6, Ivan and tank based heal striker to a surprising amount of success. When I'm not queuing up with my girlfriend, however, I often end up with... 
an ADC who assumes I'm trolling and makes it very clear that they are tilted by me and my life choices. If we lose, it's almost always me that gets blamed. I've been wanting to try these picks in ranked, but am a little worried about what my oddball star will do to team morale. Am I overthinking it or am I better off sticking to what my teammates are more familiar with? A bit of context, I have no ambitions of climbing to high elo and am more than happy eventually settling in at a rank of gold or around there. Okay. Well, do you want to start or? Yeah. I My initial reaction before we discuss it further is if you don't have ambitions to climb to high elo, you want to really just enjoy the game, just have that, that mindset of like, how can I make this champion work? That might just be a really thing that you just enjoy. You love it. I mean, it sounds like the fact that you're asking this question, you want to enjoy playing these champions. And if you don't really have that ambitions of high elo, you can have fun and play like these, just mute all and just, just have fun and just play with these champs and play these crazy off meta picks. Um, and yeah, your challenge can be like, how, maybe if you just want to be happy, you're sitting in gold. How can I get this off weird off meta pick to a gold level? <clears throat> what do you think, Curtis? Yeah, I, I think that this screams to me cupcake. You know, Cupcake, if you've, um, we have an episode with Cupcake on our podcast. He's a support coach. Um, he was an ex player for Dire Wolves. And when he first came up, he always had wacky off meta picks. He did, didn't and he? Remember when, when he was only Bard before anyone played Bard? I think there was another support, um, another support champion that he played that no one played. I can't remember. But he was always the one that played wacky support picks. And his, his philosophy in, in the game and his upbringing in, in terms of league was always around just playing a lot of the game and having a lot of fun. Like, he wasn't taking it over serious, over, overly seriously. I mean, he he was in the sense that he was a competitor like 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 him. This is why it screams cupcake. Right? He's a competitor. He's a martial artist. He, he has competitive outlets. And he seems like probably a naturally competitive person. But the way Cupcake, I guess, externalized or like... Um, the way he kind of got across or, or his his competitive outlet was doing it his way. It doesn't have to be anyone else's way. So I think as long as you, you don't have a timeline, right? As long as you, you're not like rushed to get a particular rank and as long as you're you're having fun, there's no there's nothing wrong with that. But I think a lot of people thrive. Like for Cupcake, he, he loved the champion so much. He's they, like, I yeah, love Bard. Yeah. I love this wacky thing. No one's playing it. You know what? I'm going to figure out a way to make yeah. it work. It's Yeah, the word thrive. It's also, you feel like you got a chip on your shoulder to prove to everyone, like, I'm going to make this work. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. No, no. I mean, yes, the, you, you are in a way handicapping yourself. and But yes, I think there is a definite real um, effect on team morale. I think there is no doubt about that. But I think that you could easily... Um, you can easily turn the tides of the morale in a game by just playing well. Yeah. Like if you do well in lane or you do well in general, people are going to forget it instantaneously. Sometimes the way I think about it, like, you know, we talk about like you have like bars and stats or something like that. Your fun of the game plus champion mastery and knowing how to play these weird, wacky picks will like outweigh exactly bad team morale and stuff like that. If you get those high enough. Because what happens, right, is that the more fun... Or the more satisfaction and contentment you're getting, you're actually having while playing the game, the more curious and open-minded and, um, I guess, incentivized you are to problem solve. You know what I mean? Like you're you're naturally gonna be more engaged with with what you're doing, right? So when you're not having fun with something and you're you're, you're feeling bored, you're not feeling connected with the task you're doing you don't get as much from it. The more engaged you are, the more you get from something. The more you put in, the more you get out type thing, right? So I think that as long as you're having a blast and you're, that's what you're obsessed about, I see no problem with it. Have a crack. Have a crack. Enjoy, have fun. And you know what? Most of the time, you know, you say, I reckon if you get really good at it, you know, again, if you're a really competitor, I don't know exactly. I mean, again, martial arts, I'm assuming that he really mm. likes to compete and he talks about that analogy of mm. hand and glove sparring. Um you might actually get higher than gold. Wait, I mean, I, I think there's no question about that. Yeah. No question. 100%. All right. Uh, next question here. This one here is from Magnus. The title of this email is Overcoming Common Trends in My Mistakes. Uh, greetings. Magnus from Salto Academy here. I'd like to hear your take regarding fixing a quote unquote bad play style. Let's say I identify a trend in the mistakes I make on the rift. To a degree, this trend 
is a representation of my interpretation of the game. How do I go about fixing this trend? The way I see it, there are two general approaches. Number one, get into the details of each particular mistake, review it and try again. I slowly improve and pave my way towards being a better player with a healthier interpretation of the game. Number two, shock my perspective by forcefully adopting an extreme play style that represents the polar opposite of the trend. Then having experienced that, I attempt to find a healthy middle ground. As a particular example, I've noticed that I force a bad play in the early game of almost every game I play. This usually results in my death. I believe the root of this issue is a combination of being scared of not getting anything done early in the game, as well as simply not yet having the experience and skill to identify good plays. Here the options are. Number one, continue attempting early ganks and plays, viewing each one and learning what good plays look like. Number two, play some games where I say no to every single gank every single play before the mid game, just farm as much as I possibly can. Then from there, I try to find a middle ground. Do you have the work? Yeah. So I'm really, really um, hard on this one. I have a very strong opinion. Let's hear it, Curtis. You go, go, go to the extreme, all right? If you are a hardcore early game ganking, need to get shit done player, literally do the polar opposite. So I do this. Hmm. When I learn a champion, right? I go deep on one side and then I flip it and then I go completely the other way. I'll play like a psychopath and play incredibly fast and, and crazy and trade and trade and trade and, and lower my CS and, you know, really feel out the traits. And then I'll do the exact opposite. Whenever you're feeling like, um, if you feel as though you have a problem with this particular style. So the way, I, the way I view it is that you need to feel differing ways of playing the champion before you actually solidify your take on it. So like, you know, you don't, it's like you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you've only kind of played, a, 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 let's say, for example, he developed this very hyper-aggressive gank-oriented style on every champ he's played, chances are he's never even felt what it's like to just full clear like three times on that champion ever. Like he's never even felt, he's never even been in that situation ever. So unless you, unless you've, until you've been in that scenario and you know what it feels like to be two levels up on the enemy jungler, and already getting that early item and actually being way stronger than you, 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 you normally are. You don't actually know what the strengths and weaknesses are of that style. And you don't even know how, you don't know how it remotely feels like. Um, so therefore, you're not even going to know what you inherently enjoy more. So I would throw the whole idea of winning and losing out the window. Literally come into the game thinking, and ideally I do this on a second account. And say to yourself, okay, this is purely an experiment. I don't give a shit whether what, what happens this game, I don't care if I, I win, I don't care if I lose, I don't care how embarrassing it is, I'm going to do the complete opposite of what I normally do. And I, di and I did this on Jace as well, on many champions where I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit here, not interact until two items. Great. And I want to know what it feels like to be 10 CS per minute or 11 CS per minute at two items with Jace. And great, I felt that. Well, oh, interesting. I make some, you know, make some observations and then try something different and do it. Do the and, and feel that out. And if you do that, I promise you, you'll get some massive breakthroughs. Because the the way I, I view it from a visual visual representation, you go from a, like I, I visualize like a speedometer, like on a car. You, you're traveling at like you know five miles an hour. Then you go a hundred miles an hour. And then because you've you've now you've calibrated, you know what you can, you know, how slow you can go, you know how fast you can go. Then you're typically going to naturally calibrate and find that middle ground and be able to you know, um, yeah, find the perfect middle ground in the middle, I guess. Now, this is interesting, Curtis, because this is like, I think that sounds great for mid lane. I actually don't think this works for jungle. Right, I'm just speaking from my perspective. Yeah, from yeah. mid lane. He's in Salto Academy here. So, you know, what I see a lot on the stream, when I do my stream and my reviews, I like pinpoint out like, okay, the enemy jungle is ruining the game here. Ruining the game. They don't have the, uh, they're basically, you know, forcing some gank, and they're getting triple kill because they're, you know, they get, he's ganking. He has a Yumi Ezreal and he's ganking a Nora Samira. And his, his play style in his mind is to spam right. gank, right? So it's just a straight up ruining the game. I think that's a lot different than a Jace trying to skip ditch of minions and just go for a heavy trade right, here and there. I right. think there's a huge difference. Yeah, I would agree. I think jungle, especially the way I teach the game, you've got to, especially if you're in the academy, if you're new to learning the game, 
I think that the whole idea of you have a play style, you need to eliminate it and just learn how to play real proper League of Legends first. What's a good gank? What's a bad gank? What's the general strength of my champion? Before making your own style mm, the champion, mm. how about we learn how to play the optimal way of the champion? Because mm. a lot of this is figured out. You don't have to figure this out. Right. I have guides in my thing. How do I play Lilia? How do I play, you know... There's clear reference there's points. There's clear reference points and you should learn how to play that way first. So I think that there is no going to the extreme. Mm. You know, going for the second one, he says... Uh, he had two options going into the thing. Do I get into the details of each particular mistake, review it and try again and slowly improve and pave my way towards being a better player with a healthier interpretation of the game or the shock my perspective and go the complete opposite. Mm. That was your one, but mm. I think more to the one, first one. Mm. Just slowly chip away at each of the mistakes, become a proper fundamental player right. there. And then over time, maybe you can develop, you know, sort of like a play style and stuff. So that's my advice. And again, I think that's actually where jungle and stuff differ. Because like, mm. if you actually think about it, in terms of like, maybe you could take that approach to like some fights, but again, how little a, jung a jungler's fighting, you know, mm. like in terms of team fight and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's just very different because... Like I, I, you know, I, I always think back to like, um, remember when, uh, uh, Dicky learned to Zia. So this is mm. like perfection fancy. Do you remember that? Like in Dire Wars. Back. Yeah, and he just he just he had like a twenty percent win rate or something like, like that. Games, just inting yeah. for like hundreds of games. Like yeah. I feel like if you like int ganks and all that sort of stuff with your champion, I mean maybe you can learn how to but divide. I, I, but I think look, it just doesn't work the same way. It's interesting because because I've seen players who are literally so stuck in their ways they never they never get out. Yes, they can't get. Like so they, you they have to you do have some to shock the system. Shock system that's yeah. what. That's why yeah. I'm so big on it because yeah. okay, it's very different. So you're talking about like a a like a Zerath player or like what are you talking about? Like okay. someone who just sits back, someone who like sits back permanently, and you just want them to just start. Tr well, it's usually the other way around. They're just too aggressive. You yeah, need to turn them back. And yeah. So it's usually like they 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 don't focus on the farm. Like again, you don't. I'll use an example. Let's take Ari. Right. Ari has this weird kind of like connotation where it's like you don't scale. Like there's like, so you have to like do shit early. But the reality is that Ari's a dog shit laner. You don't actually win lane, right? So, so you have to get it through your skull that you got to get to Everfrost with decent farm. Like you got to, you got to like literally brute force it. It will feel weird. It will feel like, oh, I'm losing. I'm, I'm, I'm like going even with like an Oriana or something. Aren't I losing the game? But you have no choice. You gotta, because then you can pop off. If you if if an Ari gets nine CS per minute to Everfrost and Ionians, you take over the game. Like you can do so much. But until if you've never done that ever, because your default response is, is completely conditioned to I must, you know, heavy trade early, try and get my kills and try and solo kill at six and farm six point five CS per minute. You don't even have. Even if I tell you, you know, you scale, it won't matter until you felt it. You need to actually feel. Getting to Everfrost with nine CS a minute. That's it. This is like I've, I've in my experience, it's the only way to combat that. I have yes. not. I, I, yeah. I've given advice. Slow it down. They don't take it. They, it, you, they won't change their behavior. Extreme, like you that. have to go to the extreme to fucking get them out of that mindset. You know. Hmm. So I think that there are. But again, this is where coaching is a very personalized thing. I think there are players that don't. They haven't got that those bad habits or they're not stuck in their way. So you can give them that advice. Oh here, just slow it down a little bit and they'll be able to take that advice. Boom. They fix one or two things and they're on the right track. So I think it depends on how many games they played with the champ, how long they've been in that rut for, how long they've played the game for. Like it's a lot about their league history, I think as well. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. The only like really practical, you actually again think about jungle, the only like extreme thing you could do if you're like a spam ganking person, you just tell them you full clear no matter what every single game, you know that what it feels that's like. That's what I'm saying. That's basically all of it. Yeah. That's, that's it. It's like, that's just like one thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, like yeah. what does it feel like to do as, say, you, say you're, you're coaching an Elise player, right? Yeah. And this Elise player has never done two full, two full clears before without, without ganking. Yeah. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's like, something you, something you would yeah, feel. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. saying they would do that every game. I'm not saying you do that long term. Mm. You would just do that like a few games. It's like, okay, what does it feel like to play at least where I get two full clears off without mm. like just ruining the game? Yeah. yeah. You know? And, and that's an interesting, it's an interesting, if you were just like a, a thought experiment, it's like, you know, we we're talking about before that other century, how he unlocks something in his brain. That's the way I view it. It's like, you're just doing it to unlock something in your brain and view the game a different way. And it's not sustainable. It's It's silly. But then again, you should hypothetically reset your brain in a way. It's like, oh, okay, there actually is maybe some other things that I can do. And then you're, you're more open-minded to the idea that other things can be played differently, you know? So I don't know. That's just that's just what I've noticed in my program. But like you said, I think jungle is very different. So yeah, yeah I can't Jungle is just that. a very structured role. You're very that's limited. what I think as well. Jungle is like this this role where, you know, it's, 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 
Yeah, it's you cl very clear reference points, I feel like. It's yeah. like something is obviously like clearly good and clearly bad, I feel like, for, yeah. for a lot of things in general. Yeah, it's like, okay, enemy jungle's on the side of the map, I trade. Uh, this is gankable, this is not gankable. Yeah, you it's know, very clear. Is, it's very clear. Very, so my team's on the, the map, part, I'm adapting yeah. to my team, I can't contest At this At least side. for the majority of the ranks. The, yes. like, like for the 99.9, yeah. 99% you know, of the journey, you know? Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. I think, yeah, mid laners, top laners, support. I think they're all very, you can do a lot of things. You have a lot of I options. think AD carry is super structured. You're sort of also, very depending limited. on the game. Like, like I think as game. a jungler, it's like very and clear jungler. every game. Mm. Whereas a mid lane, it's like some games will be very, very clear. Mm. Some games will be like, eh. And some games it's like, I have no fucking clue. Sometimes I do a coaching session. Yeah. Think about this for a second. Yeah. You know, you tell me every session you do, mm. every coaching, every review you do, you know exactly the, basically the right play. Like, you know, like watching it, it's like, yeah. I'm ne you're, you're never really confused. Mm. Like there's times where I'm like genuinely like head scratching. Like, I don't really know. Interesting. The only time I'd all say that for jungle is like, okay, we just have no win condition at this point. Right. But that's, yeah. that's what I mean. So that's pretty rare. That, I mean, like in mid. That's what, is that what you're saying? Like there's no, what's the win condition? Like I don't, like, oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. It's like, it's like, you have no, no, what's next. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. I don't really know yeah. what's actually like, I'm like, all right. How often does that game. happen though? How often? Um. Oh, I'm not, it's not super often, yeah. but it happens. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, mm. I, I can't give you a number, but it happens. But like in, my, in when the way you talk about your coaching, it's like yeah. you fucking got to solve. Like, well, there's a solution. You know, yeah. there's, like a, there's like okay, that that's <laughs> right, that's right. You know, whereas for me, it's kind of like, yeah. Well, this could work, and that also could work, and you could also do that. Like, I feel like as a mid laner, especially in mid game, there's so many options. Like as a jungler, I feel like I'll, you know, obviously, again, we're talking. In, generalizations which is always shit to do anyway but like as a general rule of thumb as a jungler you have less options mm. whereas a lane especially if you're like a, a mid-game spiking champion there's many things you can do because you're taking tp right you can that's right there's you know, so much to do, yeah. that even simply having tp yeah. just changes the way you can navigate the mid game all right we'll finish off here curtis with a another success story this one here is from Alurus. Yep, I know him. He's from the MLA. All right, we I got, believe. This is literally just a MLA promotion. <laughs> <laughs> An MLA testimonial. A success story. All right. Uh, so this email was BBC success story from zero to D4. I don't know what that means. Zero. Does that mean like nothing? Like what does that mean? <laughs> just from zero to D4. Level zero. <laughs> Level zero. My name is Alurus, uh, and I've been a member of the Milan Academy since April 2023. I'd like to share my story of achieving Diamond 1 after 1.5 years of playing League of Legends. Okay, so he's only playing for a year and a half, and he's on Diamond. He's at Diamond. All right. Well, this is interesting. This sort of breaks a lot of some, some of our narratives we think in terms of the pros learning for some people. You know, who knows? This guy is going to be a talented, the next coming of, second coming of Faker, all right? A little bit. More about me. I'm 29 years old and work remotely full-time as a lead creative producer at an IT company. I also have extensive gaming experience. This is important, guys, for context. Don't think, oh my God, this guy's been my friend. This is very important. I've been playing competitively since I was 14 years old and achieved a high rating in every game I played across different genres. This includes reaching Immortal in Valorant, top 1.5 to 2%. High ranks in Tekken 7, top 7%. 6K MMR in Dota 2, top 5%. Five, top 5%. Mythic Raider in WoW, top 5 on the server, and many other games. I'm also a gym enthusiast. Wow. This guy is Jesus. I mean, he's 29 years old, so he's had a lot, had a lot of, of time. Life. Yeah, I was going to say, dude. Imagine if you're like 19 years old, you've done all that, dude. Like, dude, someone's on this guy ASAP. Eh? This is like the next, like, JoJo Piano or something like for NA, right? Um, I'll add my in-game statistics to my OPG profile at the end, but here's how it all started. I began playing League of Legends in Season 12 when I was bored and looking for another competitive game to play. A group of my friends had been playing League for a long time, so I joined them. I initially started with normal games and later transitioned to Flex Queue, Duo Queue, and Solo Queue in my first season. I didn't take League very seriously and tried out a variety of champions while playing... Uh, in all the different queues simultaneously. I ended up gold one after playing 600 games of solo queue in 320 days. Okay, so that's um, that's about yeah two games a day. It's really good. In season 13 this year, split one, I decided to take the game more seriously and join the Midland Academy in April. I put in my best effort during this season and approached in the same way I approached every game before throw shit against the wall and see what sticks 
I had some sort of process, but my reviews and level of detail were shallow. My ego was inflated due to my gaming background. I had a terrible case of perfectionist mindset and a significant lack of respect for the game. How can I be so bad that I can't even achieve a diamond level? I thought I had to play perfectly and carry every game or it didn't count. I would mentally beat myself up for any mistakes in my gameplay for every death. Somewhere in the end of the season, after listening to a lot of Broken by Concept content, I had a breakthrough. I started learning the game from scratch. I dropped to gold about four times during the season. In total, I played 820 games in 187 days during season 13, um, split one, with a peak rank of Platinum 1 ending the season in Platinum 4. So that's split one of this of this season. So he finished the split one, Platinum 4, and he played a lot more. He took it seriously. It looks like he played. So he played about four games about four games a day for the duration of six months' time. Yeah. In Season 13 Split 2, I changed my approach. Thanks to Broken My Concept Curtis and the Milan Academy community, I accepted my skill level and how challenging League actually is. It is really hard, and to get good at it, you have to approach it like a PhD. I began to learn the game rather than run from its difficulty. Most importantly, I became more gentle and kind to myself. I managed to separate separate my self-worth from my performance in league. Instead of saying, how could you make such a mistake, you stupid monkey? I now say, you did your best. Good job, mate. We can analyze it later. Focus for now. Additionally, I played less and adjusted my schedule. I slept more and created a dedicated time for my games where nothing in the world would distract me. I established a routine before my gaming sessions. I cleaned up the kitchen and living room while listening to Broken My Concept. I reviewed my previous games and asked questions in the VOD channel. Uh, no review longer than five minutes. I love that, by the way. Nice, short, sharp, get learnings. That's why I usually recommend for VOD reviews. I played a lol dodge game for about five minutes until I reached a certain score three times while listening to my motivational league ready playlist. And I started my block while playing a lol dodge game in queue. Despite all that, I was stuck in Emerald 2 for 200 games during the season. It was mentally taxing, but the new approach helped tremendously. After 200 games, something clicked, and I skyrocketed to Diamond 4. I did drop back to Emerald a few times, but managed to climb back to Diamond, and now I'm here to stay and climb even higher. I'll put the stats up on the screen for you guys if you're interested. You recorded, you went really in depth, you recorded all the stats for his seasons and games. Okay, now here's the dot points. Obstacles I faced. Number one toxic friendship group my friends have been playing league for more than eight seasons with the best player reaching diamond four while i played flex cure joker with them i adopted many negative narratives and views that continue to hinder my progress to some extent such things such as ezreal is a useless adc or nobody below diamond can play viego well or kazix is broken champion because he has one shot in invisibility and blaming teammates for their mistakes or for not playing how they wanted were common practices among them. I believe all these narratives significantly hampered my progress. If I had played solo from the beginning, I would have improved much more quickly and adapted to solo queue faster. I stopped talking about League at all with my friendship group, and it was the best decision. Uh, number two, meta changes. People often underestimate how much patches can affect their progress. In my first season, I played a lot of Zed in patch 12.12, .12, the durability update. Lethality Zed became almost useless. Before the patch, I spent a lot of time learning damage, matchups, and testing my limits. After the patch, all of that was thrown out the window. I couldn't adapt a Zed to the new patch and change my main to Yone. A similar situation occurred when they changed ADC items. But this time, I adapted better and stuck with Yone to prevail. And the last point here is champion pool. When I joined MLA, I had only been playing Yone, but I added Akali shortly after. Having two complex champions in my pool slowed me down. After realizing this, I stuck with Yone and Vex if Yone was banned or taken on my main account and continued learning Akali on my secondary account. Tips that I'll give to my past self. Number one, be gentle with yourself. No one should judge you except for you. You're here to represent your best self and improve, not to beat yourself up and be in sorrow. Number two, know that there's only so much under your control, but there is something in your control. Focus only on what you can control and don't let other things like toxic teammates or bad streaks disturb you. Number three is trust the process. You may not know when, but eventually it will carry you. Just show up and do your job. Uh, big thanks to Nathan Curse for the VC podcast. Jokes aside, it's a unique life-saving life product for gamers even outside of League. 
you're a huge inspiration and teach people how to be their best, um, better selves. So a big thanks to Curtis to, for the MLA platform. Special thanks, special place to learn and get into the details. Special thanks to AJ, my Yone Senpai, for guidance and support. And a huge thanks to Tim for his mental and positive energy. And thanks to my girlfriend for her endless support on this journey. You are my best team teammate. Love heart. Wow. You know, you know what I want to, the biggest thing that jumps out to me. Mm. Think about all his gaming achievements, you know, all, is across many game titles. He still joined the MLA. Mm. Think about that for a second. That's, that's a show. Even though he had an ego, he said that. He didn't have so much of an ego that he, he thought he could do it without coaching. Think about that for a second. I just think that is very telling of just like the respect, you know, still, despite thinking league was maybe not as hard as he thought it was, whatever, he still bought coaching. I just think that's very telling, you know? Mm. I just think that's the first thing that really jumped out to me, you know? Um, so I think if, if he's getting coaching, think about how many other people that think they're too good for coaching have not even remotely the same league, uh, gaming achievements. That was just, just very interesting. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's really got into, into the details, man. Like, I, he's a grinder. And I think that this sort of thing um, is super inspiring. And it's also, even from a coach's perspective, me and AJ and Tim, like getting clients like this, that you know they're putting in the work, they're really showing up, they're utilizing the VOD question channel, they're actually putting their all, keeps us on our toes. And yeah, it's like, shit, I, you know, I've got to- Get to get shit to go to help this guy. This yeah, guy, make sure, because he's really, he's giving it all. I want to make sure that I'm, mm. we're providing, make sure that he is getting the right information and everything. And I think that, um, I love clients like this and it keeps us fresh and it's actually one of the big um, motivating factors in the program for me. So. Yeah, you hear like, uh, you know, you, uh, you hear a lot of the stories about the casters that they go to like worlds and sort of stuff mm. and they say that there's a big difference casting in like a studio than like a big crowd because the crowd gives them energy. Yeah. I think that's the same with like yeah, these clients, clients that are really, you know, involved. They're really curious, ask questions, you know, they have a positive mindset towards the game. It's they give me energy. Yes, 100%. for sure. I want to say as well, like, you know, this, you know, this process that he's created here, these four amazing points, process, right? wasn't it? You know, he's, he's cleaning up the kitchen living room before he's, he's removing room, mental baggage, he's he's allocating time, routine, reflecting, lol, dodge game, keeping the hands warm. Dude, if you do this for another two years, you will be a machine. You're going to be pretty good at the game. You're going to be very good at the game. I mean, he's already very good at the game, but yeah. you're going to be extremely good at the game. If yeah. you could keep that up for like an extended period of time, holy moly. And I love, you know, it's so funny because when you see these things, you know, people would expect, oh my God, he got this insane rank. He must be doing something super sophisticated, right? Think about that. The, the number one piece of advice was be gentle to yourself. I just love that. I love that that is one of the key pieces of learning. It's being, it's again, giving your, yourself permission to fail. It rings true with Central as well before, like getting into the, the, the mental and the stage four stuff, holding you back, preventing you from really expressing your best self and, and, and really juicing the learnings there. And I, I love that. Just be gentle. It's okay to make mistakes. You know, it's, you, you are going to make mistakes instead of beating yourself up. Um, yeah, accepting it, being okay with it. Another thing that stood out for me there, just really uh, practical stuff about champ pool stuff. He had too, too, too many complicated champs in his pool. So he had like the Vex in there, it looks mm. like as well. So that's a bunch Ease of easier execution. to execute champs. So you have like your difficult champs and then other champs you can slot in. But are easier to execute. Yeah, what I because I remember he asked me about that because I, I said you can have two complex champions if you want to have two complex. There's nothing wrong with having two complex champions. You just got to make sure that it's going to slow down your progress in the short term because you're going to have to put a lot of time to learning it. So it's more about understanding, you know, that okay, if you are going to learn a champion like Akali, it's going to take time. You're going to have to get that 80 to 100 games in just to get baseline minimum roughly to your rank, you know, um, and that's a lot of time, right? 100 games is a lot of time, and some people aren't willing to put in that time. All right, anything else here, Curtis, to cover for this one? I mean, really, I think it's really well written, really thorough. I mean, again, I think like you said, that the process is what really jumped out to me, how amazing that process was. And look, you know, people listening to this right now think, look, at the end of the day, I can't do that. I don't have the time for that. I don't have the motivation to do that. That's okay. This is the extreme. I would say this is an extreme competitor. This is someone that really made it their mission. Just even just hearing the stats of the amount of games that they played, right? Mm. I would say this is an outlier in terms of like, you know, the intensity of the process. So you don't feel like you have to do this level of process to get insane results in league. Hmm. You know, this guy's trying to do it in a shorter amount of time. This is speed running stuff. Is he yeah. speed running shit? Like he got, he's probably jam packed what years of learning into one year, right? One season essentially. Yeah. So don't feel like 
you know, <laughs> you have to do this to get results. If you want to get fast results, sure, but this isn't for everyone. So I don't want people to think, oh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, this could be demoralizing to potentially mm. to some people, you know, mm. that's the, another thing I will know. Yeah. Yeah, but when I read the email, it says from zero to D4, like literally zero to D4. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, like you can, you know, a lot of people have our process and, uh, you know, 1.5 years, sure. Like we could, you could extend this out to, to if you double even three years, like it's, it's a great achievement. It's even a great achievement. Years. Yeah. Diamond four, like that's huge. Really huge. All right. Well, that's it for our episode then no, today, we put Curtis. a dent in the, in the mailbag today. Yep, we've... Uh, it's a little bit lighter now, Curtis. Lighter. I can now carry it on my shoulder because I just yep. carry it around all day. Yep, around the that's streets. What I do around the streets. Everyone knows it. him. That's right. The, the Nathan's that's mailbag. The, the mailbag guy. All right, that's it for this episode, guys. Good work. Keep on improving. Three block review. We'll see you next week.